Good morning, Brownsburg Baptist Church. Good to see everybody out this morning. Uh, Why don't you stand with us as we start our service today. We're going to sing page 636, I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make of my troubles quickly an end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Continue on with us, page uh, 344, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's bound outboard. There where the blood of the Lamb was split. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Wider than so you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace seeing, you may be see it this time. I'm thankful for God's grace, aren't you? Praise the Lord for that. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, the Bible says. And uh, the Lord is forever reaching out to each and every one of us in his grace. Brother Lonnie Lane said that spring was arriving at 1133. 1133 this morning. So... There you go. Uh, spring is here, and uh, at least it's upon us, and I hope that it, somebody alerts the weather uh, that spring is here. But we thought we'd tell you that. Uh, Rebecca is back here today. She had her baby Monday, and uh, the baby is, is uh, 
healthy, doing well, and uh, they had to get some balance in that family, so now they have a boy and a girl, uh, which is good. And uh, in this case, that girl will be watching out for her brother, and uh, at, least, at least early on. So uh, we're happy and glad for, for that, um, rejoicing in it. One of the concerns that we have on the other side of that is uh, one of our missionaries passed away, uh, Brother James Denman. And um, Brother Denman uh, was supported by this church somewhere 35 to 40 years and did a great work. And he passed away on March the 2nd. They had his funeral on the 9th. And uh, so pray for the Denman family, if you, were, if you would. His wife had passed away about a year and a half ago. He died on what would have been their 66th wedding anniversary. And uh, so, anyway, uh, Brother Denman's in heaven. And um, I look forward to seeing him there. I think the last time I saw Brother Denman, Diana and I were in Texas, and we rendezvoused with him, and we ate at maybe a Love's or something like that. Uh, it's a truck stop. It's really exotic. And, uh, but anyway, that was, that was good. We enjoyed that. And one other important thing, I'm trying to share these real quick. I know we're in Facebook land or whatever, YouTube land. Uh, but uh, Brother Schroeder and his wife found a, an apartment. And so they're going to be moving here um, and will be here uh, the weekend of April 1st. So April 1st and 2nd. First is a Friday, the 2nd is a Saturday. And they'll be here for a revival that begins uh, on that Sunday. And so, uh, fellas, this is for you particularly. If you can help us move him into his apartment, and I know everyone can't, we'll feed you some biscuits and gravy because it's men's prayer uh, breakfast on the second. And then we'll, uh, if you'll come uh, and help us to get his, his furnishings up on the second floor, uh, we need some good strong men. Okay, and so remember that April second, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna be really kind to you. We're not gonna move the piano up to the second floor. We're gonna we're gonna park it right over there, and uh, and that way it won't be something that we have to deal with. And they don't have room in the apartment to to put it there. So uh, praise the Lord for that as well. It's something we've been waiting for and anticipating. And so I'm praising God for that. So glad that each of you are here this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John chapter 5 in a portion where Jesus really defends his deity. And we're going to find it's almost like a courtroom thing setting. And he talks about the very different things that are witnesses to the very fact that he is the Son of God. Listen very intently today, because I want to tell you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you have rejected the Lord who came to save you. And so I hope that you will listen to that. And uh, so we're going to uh, have a word of prayer, and uh, then we will uh, continue with the service. And I'm going to go look for my jacket. It's here somewhere. Anyway, Father, we love you. We praise you. Meet with us today. Dear God, as we have come, Lord, a hungry people, I continue to pray that you would stir up our church, that you would stir me up, that you would stir this people up, that God, that for your honor and your glory, we would live our lives every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. The song we're getting ready to sing is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And uh, I don't get to sing the third verse song the, these ladies get to on the first part, but it's one of my favorite verses. It says, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ. That's the heart I want to have for God, and just because he shows the love first. So listen to the words. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face. For the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a 
cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a this once again as we sing our final song uh, page 774 when the roll is called up yonder when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound the time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saint of earth shall gather over Shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting song. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then if all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll I'm glad that the roll's going to be called up yonder, and I have every reason to know that when it's called, I will be there. The Bible says that you can know that you know that you know when you die that you're going to heaven. I'm thankful for that. All right, kids are already on their way out, so that's good. I wonder if they run that fast to go to school. <laughs> All right. John chapter number five this morning. Uh, we are going to, we've titled this uh, because of, we've already shared with you the fact that it's kind of like a courtroom setting. And so we've titled this message, Witnesses for the Defense. Witnesses for the Defense. And, of course, we're defending the character of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the claim that he made uh, to be the Son of God. So we begin in verse number 31 this morning of John chapter 5. The Bible says this, if in Christ is speaking, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. You sent unto John, 
and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But, verse 36, I have greater witness than, the, than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think that you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. You know, I find it interesting, and I'm going to stop there. We'll finish the rest of the passage here in a moment. I find it interesting that people refuse to come to Christ for salvation. Anytime that a, a, a gospel message is preached, and any time that someone is present that doesn't know the Lord, you would think on every occasion that that person would respond to the preaching of the gospel and that they would trust Christ as their Savior. There is not a religious event in the world that will save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you, and he desires to do that very fact. For uh, the last few weeks, we've been in John 5, and we've looked at the healing of the paralytic man where Christ got in trouble by telling the guy to pick up his bed and walk. And the no-no was that he had violated the principles of the Sabbath day. The Jewish leaders were furious about this particular event. And then Jesus began to respond to their anger in verse number 17. And they understood that he was claiming, as we preached last week, to be equal with God. He was claiming equality with God, that he was God, that he is God. It's really a staggering thing to claim to be God. If any of you told me that you were God, I would say it's time to go to the loony bin. You know, I wouldn't believe you. Anyone. It doesn't matter how angelic you think you are. I would not believe that you were the son of God, okay? Or the daughter of God as it relates to being directly conceived in, in that fashion that God brought forth Christ in the womb of Mary. It wasn't acceptable in that day, and it isn't acceptable today, but the problem was Christ truly was God and is God. But they rejected that. And so as they confronted this, they had a dilemma. You're either going to accept him or you're going to reject him. And they rejected him in the most vehement way by nailing him to a cross, getting the Romans to do that very bidding. Two doctors were touring a local insane asylum, and as they paced down the halls, they heard a man shouting at the top of his lungs, I am George Washington! He continued to shout that several times. I am George Washington. Finally, when they came to his room, the lead physician said, Who told you that you were George Washington? The man replied, God told me that I was George Washington. And the man in the bed next to him said, I didn't tell him any such thing. You know, it 
there's a lot of things that have a tinge of lunacy attached to them. And it would be lunacy for a man to claim to be God if he were not. Buddhism says that Jesus was wise and an enlightened teacher who taught similar things to Buddha, but that he was merely a man. Islam says that Jesus was a prophet. As a matter of fact, if you look at their prophets, he would be number three on the prophet list. Not number one, not number two. Muhammad would be number one on the prophet list. But Islam says that Jesus was a prophet sent by God, but still a man. Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was neither God nor man, but they claim that he is Michael the archangel. False. Mormonism says that Jesus was a created man who became a god, but not the eternal god of the universe. See, Mormons are what we call god makers. Adam is actually the god of this world. Did you know that? In their religious system, he isn't the god of this world. But in their religious system, they claim that. And so we call Mormons the god makers. Unitarianism says that Jesus was a great example of God's love who demonstrated God's compassion for humanity. And then probably the worst of all, L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, doesn't believe that Jesus even existed. That he's a myth. Sad, isn't it? It's amazing that you would believe that through the ages of time, that with the celebrations of both Christmas and Easter, that you could believe that Jesus was a fairy tale, that he was a man of myth, a man of mythology. But Jesus' claims are far different than any of their heretical religious systems that we just talked about. He claimed to be eternal God in human flesh. I don't know how else to put it. Eternal God in human flesh. Able to forgive sin. Able to forgive sin. You can't, I can forgive you for offending me, but I can't forgive your sin. Only God can forgive sin. So the only defense against any charge of blasphemy would be for Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was. And so that's what this passage is about. Jesus Christ bringing forth witnesses. Did you notice the word witness over and over again? Bringing forth these witnesses that would speak to clarify the truth of his deity. And so here's the thing, Here, here's the nuts and bolts of the message today, is this, if Jesus Christ is God's son who came and died on a cross, was buried, rose again three days after his death to redeem your soul, if you reject him, you have no hope of eternal life. And I ask you, if that is the case, why would you reject him? There are reasons that people would give. But they're not valid reasons. They're not good reasoning. Uh, matter of fact, I would say it's foolishness to reject Christ. I believe that. That anyone who rejects Jesus Christ is foolish in that decision. I want people to go to heaven. God wants people to go to heaven. And the choice is yours. Amen. Not someone else's choice. It's your choice, and you need to make that choice. you got to be a little bit older to, to know this, but, you know, this is, again, quite a case. He makes, uh, Jesus Christ makes Ben Matlock and Perry Mason look like a couple of law school dropouts. 
You guys remember Ben Matlock, don't you? I liked him better as Jed Clampett. Ben Matlock, no, that was Andy Griffith, wasn't it? Ben, ben Matlock. I liked him better as Andy Griffith. But anyway, Jesus Christ defends himself, and the legal language is a major feature of this particular gospel. It's about witnessing, it's about confessions, it's about testimonies, it's about judgment. It's about the passage uh, that says there's no exception to these rules. You see, they're used over and over again. The words witness or witnesseth or testify or testimony appear in these verses 11 times. And the words believe and receive appear nine times. So it's about you believing that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he is the only savior of mankind, and you responding and saying, I am going to accept you as my savior. I did that July the 14th, 1963. Each of you have done that, who are saved today at some particular point in time. So I want us to notice, first of all, the witnesses that are recounted by Jesus Jesus is presented as a judge and a defense attorney, an advocate, and he's on trial. He chooses to act as his own attorney. The roster of his character witnesses includes John the Baptist, Moses, miracles, the Bible, God, the Father, and Christ himself. So I want you to see in verse 31 that the first witness is the Savior himself. Verse number 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. You needed to bring two or three witnesses to convict someone of the crime that they were charged with. But Christ mentions the very fact and speaks to that very fact. He claimed an authority back in chapter number 2 when he cleansed the temple and did what the Messiah was prophesied to do. He testified of his own power back in chapter 3 when he spoke with Nicodemus about his necessity to be born again. In verse number 18 of John 3, he said, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth on uh, not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus testified to be God in chapter 4 as he spoke with the woman at the well. And ever since we began this discourse in chapter 5, he's been defending himself. He got in trouble when he told the man that he healed to take up his bed and walk. Christ is acknowledging to you and to me that he's either God or a fake. You've heard me say it before, Jesus Christ cannot merely be a good man, a good teacher, or a good prophet. So, the next day, John said in chapter number one, behold the Lamb of God. Praise the Lord for that. Behold the Lamb of God. He wanted to point him out. He wanted people to understand. He wanted people to know this is who Christ is. It's important for us to recognize that here today. If a man is writing prescriptions, seeing patients and performing surgeries, it's a probably a pretty good idea that he's a doctor. Unless you lived in Mars Hill, then he may not have been. No. If a man is watching students grading homework and writing lesson plans, it's a pretty good sign that that person is a teacher. Would you agree with that? I would. In all seriousness, Jesus says, if you want to know who I am, I want you to watch what I'm doing. That's what he told John the Baptist, hey, Go, go back and tell John, this happens, this happened, this happened. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, the scriptures say, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, 
Speaking of this future ministry of Christ, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Jesus was content to let his work speak for him. In Matthew 11, he reassured John with a story of miracles. Again, ask the blind man. Ask the deaf girl. Ask the mute man. He'll talk to you, telling you about me. Ask the crippled man, the one in chapter 5 that's carrying his bed. And so we see that powerful and mighty witness of the Savior. What a blessing, what a blessing today to be able to know and to realize this reality. And so we have the Savior. We have the servant, as we talked about John the Baptist in verses 32 and 35. He was the voice, it was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was one who who was mightier than than he. He was not worthy to unloose the latchet on his sandals. So we see the Savior, we see the servant, we see the signs that he did as we mentioned those miracles. In verse number 36, he speaks about that, but I have greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish the same works that I do Bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. You would have to acknowledge and agree with the very fact that Jesus Christ was unique in that he was a miracle worker. A lot of people were not miracle workers. And then the sovereign in verses 37 and 38, the Bible says this, and the Father himself, which has sent me, hath Born witness of me, ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent him ye believe not. Do you see the connection? You can't reject Christ and be a Bible believer. It's an impossibility. Because the Bible testifies of Christ over and over and over and over again. And so the sovereign God testifies of his son. When when he was conceived, God didn't send postcards. He sent an angel named Gabriel to announce his birth. When Christ was born, a multitude of heavenly hosts glorified God in the highest. Then when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice and a dove that lit upon him. John the Baptist said in John 1, 33 and 34, He that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Why? It was because upon Jesus Christ, The Spirit descended, and a voice from heaven was heard that said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. And then we see the Scriptures, the witness of the Scriptures in verse number 39. The Bible says this, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life. You can't read the Bible very long at all without understanding and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that He is God in the flesh, and that He is the Redeemer of mankind. Read the Gospels and learn. Read the book of Acts and learn. Read the epistles and learn. Read the Old Testament and learn. The Scriptures testify of Christ And he's telling them, search the scriptures. I would challenge anyone who's here that isn't lost, search the scriptures. 
there are so many people that think they have eternal life. There are so many people that think that they're going to heaven when they die, and they don't have eternal life, and they're not going to heaven when they die. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Because they are they which testify of me. Someone said that you could find Jesus Christ on every page in your Bible, that there's a scarlet thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation. These witnesses were recounted by Christ. It's important that we recognize these witnesses. The Savior himself, so important. The servant, the signs, and the scriptures. But I want you to see, secondly, that these witnesses were rejected by the Jews. It didn't matter how many witnesses Jesus Christ brought forth, they continued to reject him. There are people who will reject Christ more than once, multiple times throughout their lifetime, and, and lift up their eyes when they die in hell, and with great remorse, they'll realize the mistake that they had made. I believe there's a heaven and a hell. There's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to shun. And the choice, again, is not anyone's but yours because God has already done what he needed to do but the, these witnesses were rejected by the Jews some have called the O.J. Simpson trial the trial of the century and some people an overwhelming majority of people believe based upon the DNA evidence and the circumstantial evidence and the blood evidence the fingerprint evidence the footprint evidence and more most people believe that O.J. Simpson, 87% believe that O.J. Simpson was guilty of murder, that he got by with it. The problem in that trial was there was a, there was a police officer, Los Angeles police officer named Johnny Cochran, who was who put on trial this detective. His name was Mark Furman, the the attorney was Johnny Cochran. Johnny and Mark Furman had made racist comments. And the community was angry already because of the incident with Rodney King. Some of you remember that incident. I'm not going to go into details about it, but some of you remember that. And so the jury returned a verdict of not guilty when most Americans thought he was guilty. My purpose in bringing up that trial is to say that most Americans believe, again, that the jury overlooked the overwhelming amount of evidence that had been put there because they'd already made up their mind. You know the sad thing? Many people have already made up their mind. There's no way I'm trusting Christ. There's no way that I'm going to embrace Christianity. There's no way that I'm going to change my lifestyle for heaven. It's sad, isn't it? It really is sad. The Jews did that very thing. They rejected every matter of biblical proof. It's a theological fact. Why did they do that? Well, the reason other people do it. Number one, they have a lordship problem. I don't believe in lordship salvation, but I believe that, that, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of every believer. There's a difference. Jesus is Lord, no matter if you uh, accept him as such or not. It doesn't matter. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. But he should be your Lord. The church should embrace Christ after their salvation as being the Lord of their life. And what he says, we do. What he bids, we follow. But they had a problem with lordship. They didn't know a lot about the life of Christ. But they knew that it, would that it would require a change of life. And they didn't want that. Jim Ray and I have witnessed to a man on multiple occasions who has told us that he will die and go to hell 
because he will not give up his sinful lifestyle. It's sad, isn't it? You know, it's easy to say that today. I'm not giving up my pleasures. We talked in Sunday school about a narcissistic society. But it's so true. I'm not giving up anything. I will risk dying and going to hell. I'll put it off. Some people say, I'll put it off until later. And you know what? Later never comes. John eleven forty seven and 48, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees, the council, and said, what do we, for this man doeth many miracles? Trust him? Hello? Trust him? Worship him? Accept him? Follow him? Those are novel thoughts, aren't they? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. I would love to have a saved planet. Wouldn't you? All men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Too bad. I'm going to heaven when I die. So many people reject Christ because of the issue of lordship. Their life is filled with recreation, with money, with hobbies, with self-interest, and to take time to serve the Lord is too much to ask. I want to say to you today as a believer You should get excited when someone else praises the Lord. You ought to be thrilled when someone else defends Jesus and his character and who he is and his ability alone to save others. They had a lordship problem. They had a love problem. Verses 41 and 42. Verse 40, the lordship problem. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Verse number 41 and 42. I receive not honor uh, from men... But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. They had a love problem. Jesus told the church at Ephesus that it had a love problem, didn't he? That they had left their first love. Here he tells these people that they didn't have love in the first place. They thought that they were fulfilling the great commandment when really they were not. They were filling their own egos. In the book of 1 John, there are numerous references to people who don't have the love of God in them because they don't love others, and they don't love God himself. I want us to read for just a moment because this is about the love issue in Matthew chapter 22. So turn there in your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 22, and I want you to see this here for just a second. You guys... Most of you already know this passage of Scripture, but it's important that we realize what what God's opinion is about love and loving Him. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He gives an answer. In verse number 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. I really believe that we need to stop and consider that. For each and every one of us. Don't you think it's important that we nail down in our own lives that we are a people who have come to a place in our lives where our love for Christ is preeminent? That it is above all other things. And so we're to do that with all of our soul, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. Verse number 38, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love 
Thy neighbor as thyself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you know what Jesus is saying? If you don't love me and you don't love others, you don't have God. Pretty good sign, isn't it? 1 John 4, 20 says this, He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Now, I want to take a moment just to, and, and I didn't intend to do this, but I want to take just a moment to say, uh, if you can, within the next week or so, we'd like to continue to receive some offerings for the people of Ukraine. We have a missionary uh, who has contacts in Poland, who has contacts in the Ukraine, and we're getting supplies to people in Ukraine. And so make sure if you would like to help the people in Ukraine, I want you to switch it around for just a moment. Just think of it was you. Just think of your house was being bombarded. Just think of your safety was being taken away from you. I think that there would be a little bit of urgency there, would there not? And I feel like we need to show our love for, for the believers. It's going to go first to uh, the believers of Ukraine. And so people that know the Lord, there's no administrative fee taken out of it. Everything goes to them. Nothing goes to anyone here in the United States. It all goes to the people of Ukraine. I like that kind of giving. But you see, they had a love problem. If they had any love for God, they would have love for their brother. They'd have love for the poor. They would have love for the guy that was walking around with his bed after being uh, a lame for 38 years. They would love that fact. Wouldn't you be excited? I was excited to see Mike Herskadal walk in here. Just think, just think, Michael. Think about that guy, 38 years, lame at the pool, you would think you'd have to be excited if you looked up one day and there he was in church. In the temple. You'd be excited. Oh, but don't you know what day it is? You're not supposed to do something good on the Sabbath. You shouldn't heal that guy. You should have waited until Monday. Or actually Sunday. Until Sunday. The Sabbath was from Friday at, at 6 until Saturday morning. Our Saturday evening at 6. You should have waited. But you see, what Jesus is saying is, if you don't have love for me, and if you don't have love for others, you don't know me. You don't know God. They had a lordship problem. They had a love problem. And then they had a term that everybody loves to use. They had a legalism problem. And they really were legalistic. Most people want to call legalism uh, uh, anyone that has any standards about life. That's not legalism. Legalism is a belief that you have to do certain things in order to be saved. That's legalism. They spent all of their time impressing one another with how good they were. And they never acknowledged to God how bad they were. You know what I did when I got saved? I acknowledged how bad I was. I didn't say anything about being good. As a matter of fact, I said everything in the contrary to that. I talked to God about and, and confessed the very fact that I was a sinner. I couldn't save myself. There was nothing that I could do to change my destiny. And so I was putting my life in the hands of Jesus. You see, that's what the Pharisees did. They constantly constantly spoke about their how good they were to professional believers Jesus said you don't know what you're doing you're, grow you're going through the motions but your heart isn't right and I want to say something I want you to get this statement because it's true sometimes it's easier to do right than to be right I'm talking about being right with God. Sometimes it's easier for you to do right than it is to be right. Because we learn. There are habits that we learn in life. There are things that we, you know, that, that we do. 
that are even points of enjoyment. I love coming to church. I don't have to, I don't have to be prodded to come to church. I had a guy tell me the other day, church wasn't his thing. And we, we realized why it wasn't his thing. You know why? Because he didn't know God. He didn't know Christ. Cart before the horse. You're never going to love church until you love Jesus. Then you'll be thrilled with it. It'll be amazing what will happen in your life. Here a Galilean carpenter comes and tells them that they're going to have to believe on him or they're going to die and spend an eternity in hell. They didn't like that. They've already made up their minds. No amount of evidence was going to change them or persuade them. So they re, they, the witnesses were recounted by Jesus. The witnesses were rejected by the prosecutors, the Jews. And then finally, these witnesses will be recalled in the judgment. Verses 45 to 47. Look at verse 45, if you would. John chapter 5, verse number 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, think about this, the one that you exalt. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. I love this. For he wrote of me. Moses wrote of Christ. Verse 47. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? You know, Christ basically said the same thing to the rich man. Remember the conversation, the rich man died in hell. He lifted up his eyes being in torment. And he wanted someone to, 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 to take the gospel to his five brothers and Jesus said to him, if, you don't, if they won't believe Moses, they won't believe one, as though one came from the dead. You see, you have to embrace the Bible. What the Bible says. Not what religion teaches, but what the Bible says. You need to embrace the word of God and love that word because there's a profound revelation taking place in verse number 45. It says, do not think that I will again accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuseth you, even Moses. John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me, Jesus is speaking, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Don't have a problem with the word because the word will save you or the word will condemn you. You should have seen Jesus in the, in the uh, messianic prophecies of Genesis 3 is what is being said to them here in John chapter 5. Didn't you see Jesus in Genesis 3? Did you? The proto-evangel? The very first promise of the coming of a Messiah, Jesus Christ, is spoken of in Genesis chapter 3. Wow, he's there. You should have seen Jesus in Noah's ark, an ark of safety. You should have seen Jesus in Abraham's lamb when that ram was caught in the thickets and seen the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ for you and for me. You should have seen Christ with Jacob's ladder. You should have seen Jesus in the Passover. You should have seen Jesus in the feast and the festivals. You see, Jesus is all in the Bible. Covers every page of the Bible. Moses will testify against Christ rejectors along with the rest of the word of God. So we see a profound revelation. Then we see a powerless religion. Uh, 45b, the latter portion of that, notice what it says. Even Moses, in whom you trust. The Jews not only missed the person of whom Moses wrote, they missed the purpose for which he wrote. Wow. They put their hope in the law of Moses, but the law of Moses 
was never meant to bring hope. It was meant to bring despair. It was meant to show you that you couldn't save yourself. Galatians 3.24 says that the law is the schoolmaster or tutor to lead us to Christ. The law will tell you that you've missed the mark. That you didn't hit the bullseye. The law says you're a thief when you stole something. And you can't save yourself. It will not make you an honest man. It will tell you you're a thief. You need the grace of Jesus. The law will tell you that you're a coveter, you're an adulterer, you're a liar, but it won't fix you. It won't heal you. The only way that you can be changed is through Christ. That's it. One last point. Not only a profound revelation and a a powerless religion, but I want you to see a pointed rebuke here in verses 46 to 47. Verse 46 and 47, we just read them, but let me read them again. For had you believed Moses, you would have what? Believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus is simply saying to you, to me, and to the Jews, there's plenty of evidence You make up your mind. You determine who I am. If you die without Christ, it won't be because of a lack of proof. If you won't be his, if you won't be saved, it will not be because of him. It'll be because of you. There's plenty of evidence. People are confused about where Cain got his wife, and they don't even know who Jesus is. It'll be because you've hardened your heart. It will be because you chose a different path in life, that you stiffened your neck, you refused to believe. Remember, these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that believing, you might have life through his name. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. I have indeed experienced what I'm about to say in just a moment. In the U.S. legal system, there is an action called a summary judgment. That's where the facts are beyond dispute. They don't need to be uh, tried. They don't need to be brought to a jury. It's just, it's just obvious that the facts are beyond dispute and the outcome is clearly inevitable. And because of that, you would receive a summary judgment. I think the facts are clear that we would not have to retry Jesus. I think the facts are clear that there would be indeed a summary judgment that would be given and the judgment would be, this is the Son of God. Believe ye him. See, the evidence is in. The outcome is inevitable. If you're lost, stop wasting your time. Get saved today. Quit rejecting what is apparent, what is obvious If you're away from the Lord today as a believer, stop wasting your time. Get right today. Get right today. If you need to make some decision today. Dear fathers, heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I pray that you would use the message today to convict both those that may be here that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Father, work in their heart, in their life. Help them, Lord, to come to you. And then I pray, Father, for for your children today, those that know you, who maybe are wasting their time, uh, who need really to get right with you, who need a revival. Lord, I pray that you would work in them also. Father, allow our choices today be a reflection that we believe that Jesus Christ 
is indeed the Son of God and the Savior of the world, the Lord of lords and King of kings. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're going to invite you.